Well, good evening, everybody. Merry Christmas, and welcome to Woodlawn United Church here for our 8 p.m. Uh, Christmas Eve service. If anyone is new or visiting with us this evening, a warm welcome to you and to those who are watching our service online this evening. A warm welcome to you also, and just a reminder to those watching online that we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion this evening, and if you would like to participate at home, uh, you, if you have a piece of bread and some juice, or maybe it's Christmas Eve, you might have some wine handy. Uh, but certainly join us uh, as we celebrate at Christ's table on this holy evening. Uh, there are announcements in the order of service, and I invite you, when you have a moment, to please read through them. There may be something that interests you. Uh, and just to say that following the service this evening, we will be serving hot cider, I believe out, just outside the doors here, out front. So if you are able to stay for some cider, please do, uh, following the service. Uh, you're more than welcome to share a cup. And friends, as we gather in this place this evening, please remain seated as we say responsively our call to worship. Uh-oh, I'm table it. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Our Advent journey is now complete. The light of the world is here. Our hope has been met. Our preparations are done. Our joy has been made perfect. God is love and has come to live among us. The, the grace, grace of God, God has appeared, appeared bringing salvation, salvation to all. The long-awaited Christ has come, celebrating, celebrating the birth of, of our Savior. Savior. We, we light this candle. Together, Together we shall shine, shine with, with the radiant, radiant love of Christ. Please join me in our opening prayer. As once you came in the hush of the night, O God, so still our hectic thoughts now by the wonder of the season. Let not our hearts be like busy inns with no room, but doors open wide to welcome a holy guest, who is Jesus, the Christ, alive with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able, and with your mask on, please join in the singing of our first hymn, or carol, pardon me, which is number 60, O Come All Ye Faithful, verses 1 and 3, and you will see the words on the screen.
The opening verses of the Bible tell us of a cosmic God who brings order out of chaos. God speaks, and a way is made for life to flourish. In Genesis chapter 1, it is written, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The coming of Christ marks the dawn of a new day, when the goodness of God is made known. The word of God appears in the flesh, illuminating the way to life again. The Gospel of John echoes the opening verses of Genesis when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Please stand. Oops. Please stand for our next hymn, Carol, which is number 44, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear, verses 1 and 4. Light Comes by Jan Richardson. I cannot tell you how the light comes. What I know is that it is more ancient than imagining, that it travels across an astounding expanse to reach us, that it loves searching out what is hidden, what is lost, what is forgotten or in peril, or in pain. That it has a fondness for the body, for finding its way toward flesh, for tracing the edges of form, for shining forth through the eye, the hand, the heart. I cannot tell you how the light comes but that it does, 
that it will, that it works its way into the deepest dark that enfolds you, though it may seem long ages in coming or arrive in a shape you did not foresee. And so may we this day turn ourselves toward it. May we lift our faces to let it find us. May we bend our bodies to follow the light. May we open and open more and open still to the blessed light that comes.
The Gospel of Matthew is limited in what it shares about the birth of Jesus, yet it speaks of obstacles to be overcome, including things like human pride and systems of honour and shame. We remember Joseph, whose humble faith and obedience helped to make the seemingly impossible possible. A reading from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. May God bless this reading of his holy word. I invite you to stand as you are able that we might sing verses 1 and 3 of number 38, Angels We Have Heard on High. We don't usually ring, uh, read from the King James uh, Version here on a regular basis, but I am going to read for you this evening the Nativity of Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke tonight uh, from the King James Version, if only because I received this Bible as a gift uh, from Christians living in Bethlehem some years ago when I was visiting there. Uh, it's not easy being a Christian in Bethlehem these days. I don't think it really ever has been. Uh, and those gentlemen, they owned a, an olive wood shop. This uh, Bible is covered with olive wood. And they, they prayed for me and blessed me as they gave me this Bible. And I made a promise to them that as long as I had this Bible, I would do my best to read the Luke nativity story out of it every Christmas Eve. So here are the words according to the Gospel of Luke. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus 
that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was the first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up, went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ.
One of the many special gifts of Christmas is the music that comes with this season. And I am so grateful that we as a community of faith get to celebrate this gift and that we have so many people willing to share that gift with others. So thank you to our singers this evening. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, on this holiest of nights, when we are called to remember your arrival among us, we pause and we offer you hymns of praise and words of prayer. We reflect on ancient stories and on words that have been prepared and pondered and pray, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you and be for us a word of Christ, the one whose birth and arrival we welcome this night. Amen. <clears throat> so, you know, I don't believe that there is um, any human being that gets more excited than a child who gets their Christmas wish on Christmas morning. They discover the gift that was on the top of their list is there waiting for them. What do you think? The most excitable person in the world? I was thinking about it this past week because I had a second thought. Um, and I started to think, well, you know, maybe someone who can get more excited than a child on Christmas morning is a weather forecaster who is reporting the possibility of a significant weather event. Weather forecasters can get pretty excited at times. 
You know, in fact, earlier this week, you know, when the forecasters were abuzz, you know, waiting this big storm that, it, that tracked across much of the U.S. and Canada, I took a moment to go to the Weather Network's website in order to see what the buzz was all about. I was concerned how it might affect tonight services and so on. So I went to the internet site and I was struck by this headline that said, Large Storm Threatens Christmas. <laughs> I have to say, I read that headline and I laughed. I mean, I appreciate that large storms wreak havoc. They cause delays, snarl traffic, cancel flights. I'm sure that uh, there are people in this room tonight who have had uh, loved ones' uh, arrivals delayed because of the storm this past week. But, you know, when you really think about the celebration of Christmas, and by Christmas I mean the day of Christ's birth, can anything really disrupt that? Can anything really prevent the Messiah from coming into this world, from entering into people's lives? You see, the whole point, or at least a big part of the point of these stories surrounding the birth of Jesus tells us the opposite is true. I mean, 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born, there was a lot that threatened to disrupt Christmas, the birth of Christ. I mean, consider the events leading up to Christ's birth. I mean, first we have, if you go way back in the Old Testament, the Jews, the ones who had been selected by God to bear God's promise. I mean, over the ages, through prophets, through covenants, they were continually remade into this holy people who would bring the living God of love to all nations. Yet as a small people, right, the odds were always stacked against the Jews. They were constantly under threat by larger, more advanced civilizations and nations and armies. They spent many years in exile. There were times when they had forgotten about God. I mean, there were periods of hundreds of years when the Jews had abandoned their faith, got caught up in other gods, other important things in their lives. You know, you wonder when you read through the Old Testament stories, you know, if the day would ever come when God's promised Messiah would arrive. They seemed to be under constant threat. You know, would God's plan unfold? There had just been so many interruptions along the way. And then, so let us now consider the New Testament and the actual circumstances of Jesus' birth. A child born to a young woman who became pregnant under what would have been considered dubious circumstances in those days. I mean, could a Messiah really be born to a no-name teenage girl from a small town in the Galilean hills? I mean, and if there was a system that threatened Christmas, it was the social system of that day. I mean, even Joseph, you know, the one to whom Mary was engaged almost dumped her. And then there's the oppressive Roman regime under which they lived, a grand political system that threatened Christmas. Could a little Jewish baby born to a mother of lowly stature actually rise above imperial Rome, become the savior of the world? I mean, after all, you know, in that day, there had never been a civilization on this earth more powerful or more advanced than the Romans. And make no mistake, Rome saw itself as the savior of the world. What chance did Jesus have, any Jew for that matter? And then, you see, when Mary is close to her due date, the Romans call for a census. They want to count the people. They want to know how much tax they will have to collect. You know, Mary and Joseph would have traveled well over 110 kilometers by foot, you know, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that journey itself would have carried many risks. I mean, there was a good chance the baby wouldn't have been born. And after uh, that long journey, you know, it's no wonder Mary goes into labor. Right? The odds are constantly stacked against them because it looks as if there's nowhere for Mary to have her baby. I guess the health care system was a threat or problem too. But even with all the threats, with the interruptions and the disruptions, as the, the story goes, you see, God has a way of bucking the system. 
overcoming the disruptions and the interruptions. And the Christ child is born. And that's an important lesson for us because I find that most folks don't do well with disruptions and interruptions. And I, spe- I don't do well with them in my carefully planned life, life, you know, my expectations for the future and so, so on. But, you know, so much of the fear we face in life has a lot to do with things not turning out the way we want them to. We fear the things that threaten to get in the way of what we believe is important. I mean, each of us on a daily basis finds ourselves dealing with the disruptions and the distress caused by those disruptions. I mean, sometimes they can just be mere annoyances, right? Severe weather, heavy traffic. Maybe you have a child who decided it was a good day to give their little brother a haircut. You know, maybe your Wi-Fi is down. Who knows? But... You know, sometimes in life there are bigger interruptions. You know, maybe they decide to downsize your work. Maybe you have an adult child who decided to move back home. Maybe you've been diagnosed with a life-changing illness, or maybe there's a global pandemic, or maybe there's a financial pinch, or maybe something else entirely. But you see, the list of life's interruptions, major as they can be, and as varied as they can be, are as uh, plentiful as there are people on this earth. I mean, we all know what it's like to have our hopes and dreams and happiness thrown off course. The reality is that in this life, we will always face the challenges and the interruptions. But the deeper question is, what do we do when we find ourselves and our lives and our plans interrupted? You know, uh, years ago I was traveling through the country of Turkey and I visited one of those factories where they make Persian rugs. And the man who was guiding us on our tour, you know, explained how those rugs are made. You've probably seen those great Persian rugs. And sometimes they can take months, years to complete. And every now and then they work on the backside of the rug as well. And an apprentice might make a mistake, add the wrong color or do something to disrupt the pattern. But the guide told us, you know, those disruptions don't matter. When it happens, the artist does what is necessary just to weave it into the pattern. And it's what makes the rug unique, makes it a thing of beauty and a work of art. See, that's the way it's supposed to be for us. It's the way God hopes it will be for us that in many ways we cannot prevent the disruptions, but we can control how they get woven into our lives. Right? The story of God's people through the prophets of Israel, through each one of the characters in the Christmas story, are stories of lives that were interrupted and threatened. And what makes their story unique is how those disruptions get woven into a story that is not only a, a work of art, but a labor of love. Mary's love for her child in the midst of an unexpected pregnancy. Joseph's love and concern for her when he could have walked away and no one would have questioned him. The love of an innkeeper who, in spite of a no-vacancy sign and more business than he could handle, found a place for a couple in need. And shepherds whose livelihoods were disrupted by a a heavenly announcement that God had entered this world. And they went. Each one is the story of a life interrupted by Christmas. By Christ's coming into the world. And they responded in love and faithfulness. Because you see, they know what we have known. What we have known and sometimes forget when we go to set out to complete our own plans and agendas, what we have known and what we, and what we can forget when our motivation can just be in control, we forget what love can do. We forget what God can do and what God is doing. You see, it, it's not so much the question, what would Jesus do? It's more, what is Jesus doing? What is God calling me to do? 
Because this love is an imminent, active presence. You know, I was reminded many, I get reminded of this many times, but I have a story, a special story to me of, of uh, what love can do. It happened years ago. I was waiting to get on a plane from Ottawa to head home to Nova Scotia for Christmas. Ironically, my daughter was to make the same trip this evening until her flight got disrupted and canceled. And, you know, I'm not surprised because all those years ago, the day I was scheduled to leave Ottawa, I was also stuck in a large winter blizzard. And you see, while I was waiting at the airport, I remember looking at the departures monitor and how one by one each flight was being cancelled. They just started going down the list and the snow continued to accumulate outside on the runway. And while I watched and I waited, I started speaking to this guy sitting next to me who, as it turned out, had the same itinerary as me. It was going to be a flight from Ottawa to Montreal and then switch planes in Montreal to go to Halifax. Well, as we talked, you know, I learned that he was also from Nova Scotia, heading home for Christmas. Uh, he was uh, from the South Shore. And we sat and we chatted, and inevitably we learned that our flight was also cancelled. Uh, but the airline did tell us that we could expect to fly out first thing the next morning. Well, that was at about 10 o'clock at night. And I got that news, and being in university and with no car, I was preparing myself for this long bus ride back to my place from the airport, in the snow, when this fellow who shared the same itinerary I did told me how he had lived on the Quebec side of the river, if you're familiar with Ottawa, so uh, he lived in Gatineau, and he didn't mind dropping me off at my place on his way home that night. And then by the grace of God, he also came by and picked me up on the way back in at 6 a.m. the next morning. And I'll tell you what, if he wasn't a Christmas angel bearing good news, then I don't know what is. Because you see, I learned that lesson a long time ago, and I constantly need to be reminded of it. And that's how in the midst of an interruption, in the midst of a disruption, we can still be the recipients of love and grace that otherwise would not have happened. And you see, at this time of year, especially when life can become so busy and cluttered and we can get tunnel vision, thinking about the things we ought to be doing, maybe making our plans for the year to come, consumed by our own needs, we need the season of Christmas. The season we celebrate because the God of love interrupts in the flesh to call us back with a purpose and a power of faith. Faith in a spirit that comes in spite of the disruptions. A spirit that comes as a much needed interruption. Reminding us to open our eyes to love's possibility. I mean, it's not a weather bomb, but it is a love bomb. Christ overcoming so much and entering this world really is something to be excited about. Because he comes with a love that overcomes fear and a love that is without condition. A love that says no matter what may come, no matter what may threaten, no matter what may disrupt, Christmas comes for us. Christ comes for us. The God of sacred love comes for us with a spirit that weaves her way into this world with enough forgiveness and grace and mercy to make lives beautiful. Yours, mine, and everyone's. Merry Christmas.
Friends, no offering will be taken up uh, in the pews this evening, but if you wish to leave a gift, there are uh, containers at the back of the church and the entrance ways if you would like to leave a gift on your way out this evening. And I invite you to stand and let us celebrate the gift of Christmas and all that God has given us as we sing Joy to the World, verses 1 and 2. So tonight we celebrate the sacrament of communion. And as we do so, please know that this is not the table of Woodlawn United Church or the United Church of Canada. This is the table of Jesus Christ. And all who welcome Christ find a welcome at this table. Uh, the, bled, the bread we serve is gluten-free for everyone. Uh, and uh, it's juice, just so you are aware of that. Uh, when the choir will be served first, so please remain seated while the choir is served, because afterwards the choir is going to start leading us in the hymns that are listed in the order of service through the communion liturgy. Once the choir is served, beginning with the back pews, we will ask people to come to the front, and Mary Lynn and I will be at the front with two other individuals with uh, bread trays with uh, cups in them, a piece of bread in one cup, Please take the cup with the bread, take the bread, and then take the cup with the juice, take the juice. And there are baskets up at the front. Take your empty glasses and please place them in the basket and make your way back to your pew uh, by the side aisles. And if you are unable or if you would prefer to have communion served to you in your seat, please uh, give a wave to our ushers and we will be more than happy to oblige. Uh, so friends, let us celebrate at Christ's table this evening. And I invite you to follow along the liturgy printed in the order of service. Blessed are they who find Christmas in the fragrant evergreen, the chirp of the chickadee, and the soft flicker of candles. To them shall come hearts filled, filled with, with thanksgiving and, and love. Blessed are they who find Christmas in the Christmas star. May their lives ever reflect its light and beauty. Blessed are they who find Christmas in the age-old story of a child born in a stable and laid in a manger. To them a child will always be hope and promise. Blessed are they who find Christmas in the joy of gifts sent lovingly to others. They share in the joy and gladness of the shepherds and magi. Blessed are they who find Christmas in the message of Jesus of Nazareth. They shall ever strive to help bring peace on earth and goodwill to all. O Lord of life, this meal which we share on this Christmas Eve is the gift you give us in Jesus. It is the feast of the resurrection. Through him we take the steps in faith towards a life and into places where you call us to be your people, a faith that gives the light of hope you have for each of us, which is hope for the world. Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. At this table you have prepared for us, our lives intersect with your presence. We celebrate the gift of your redeeming love that calls us and our relationships with you and one another to be transformed unto new and different living. With a piece of bread and a small cup, we are reminded that you are with us. We receive the gift of everlasting life in you. For you, O God, have risked it all to have a relationship with humans and the whole of creation from the beginning. It was your voice that spoke over the darkness, bringing order in the midst of chaos. Your voice that spoke through the prophets, calling your people out of exile and into faith as your children who share a baptism with Christ, your son. We celebrate also how you made this faith known in the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Beginning with a humble birth in Bethlehem, the steps he took on this earth graced lives with healing, hope, and compassion. Yet in seeming weakness and humble obedience, he gave himself unto suffering and death on a cross. But then as he rose again, he revealed the power of a Holy Spirit that works in the most unlikely places to claim them as sacred and in the lives of the most unlikely people to show how they mattered. With the courageous people of faith throughout the ages, we unite our voices with them, proclaiming that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. On this holy night, we remember the night Jesus was betrayed. As he sat at the table and broke bread with his friends, he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Remember me each time you do this. After they had eaten, he took the cup and said, Remember me as you drink from this, for it is my life, poured out for you, the beginning of a new relationship with God. O oh God, we remember those with whom you would have us share your feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain. All who are ill or alone. Ones who live in shame. All who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. Ones taken for granted. For all whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for the church. For those who have gathered over the ages. We pray for ones who strive for peace and justice. For brothers and sisters in faith. For ones who seek the dignity of all people. We pray for places in this world where there is war and violence, oppression and greed. We pray for the hurting, the hard-hearted, and for people and concerns we carry in our hearts. O God of all power, send your Holy Spirit upon us and these gifts that they may be for us the life of Christ, a life we share as a people united in his body. We share one loaf and one cup, and exist as the one body of Christ the Church. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ your word made flesh, in the holy and life-giving spirit, joining our voices in the prayer of Jesus, as we say together, Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the cup of Christ, his life poured out for you. These are the gifts of God given for the people of God. Let us graciously receive all that God has given us, even his very self. Jesus Christ, the bread of life given for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Very boy, Christ, Christ. Jesus Christ, the bread of life.
red. Deserve. Oh, we've got lives. Good. I'll take a few more.
And please join me in our prayer after communion. O Lord of love, you feed us with no ordinary meal. We give thanks for the bread of heaven and the cup of life you share again with us this night. May our souls be so satisfied by you to know that when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with the flocks, then the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate your light every day, in every way, in all that we do and in all that we say, that all might know their true worth and your goodness. Amen. And I invite you to stand as you are able, and we will sing verses 1 and 3 of Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. Just to say that tomorrow, Christmas Day, our service is pre-recorded and will be viewable online, and we return to in-person worship uh, next Sunday, uh, January 1st. And friends, I uh, hope you can stay afterwards uh, for a cup of hot cider. And as you go from this place, may God bless you and keep you. And may God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Lord shower you with kindness and give you peace. And may you have a Merry Christmas and know God's grace in the year to come. Amen.